Hi, welcome back to Math as a Second Language, where today we're really going to get into fractions in more detail. But before I do that, I would like to talk to you a little bit about the difference between how mathematicians use the word equal and, well, maybe not the difference, maybe it's used the same way in society. For example, when the Declaration of Independence says all men are created equal, does that mean they all look alike? Do they all have the same height? Do they all have the same weight? Do they all have uh, the same, effort? whatever you want to mention. Doesn't it just mean with respect to the law? In other words, that just because you're poor doesn't mean you won't get the same justice if you were rich. If you don't have much power, you're going to get the same justice as the person who has power. See, we mean equal with respect to something. Now, for example, when you write that 6 plus 2 equals 5 plus 3, do you really think that 6 plus 2 looks like 5 plus 3? No, they're equal in the sense that what? They name the same number. And that was why in the new math, they insisted that you say 5 plus 2 is equal to, in other words, up until that time, people were saying 6 plus 2 6 and 2 are 8. No, 6 plus 2 is 8. 6 plus 2 is a, is a number, a numeral, that represents the number 8. Just wanted to make that distinction. The reason being that in dealing with fractions, we saw that in order to compare them, they had to have the same denomination. In other words, we couldn't just look at the 2 and the 3 in 2 fifths and 3 eighths, because the 2 was modifying fifths and the 3 was modifying eighths. So the real question comes up is, when you replace a fraction by another fraction, how do we really know that they're equivalent? I don't like to use the word equal, that they're equivalent in the sense that they name the same fractional part. And that's what I want to discuss a little bit in today's session. For example, let's suppose we ask the question, which number is greater, two-fifths or three-eighths? Now, if you use the number line, how does that work? We'll call this the number line, and we'll look. And this will be one unit. The whole number line is one unit. And in fifths, what do we do? We break the number line down into five pieces of equal size, and two fifths would then be, say, this size over here, or, or these two pieces, either way. And how would we find three eighths? Well, now you divide that same length into eight equal pieces so that even though you're taking three of them, we don't know for sure whether these three pieces add up in length to more than these two pieces. So what we had to do was to find a common denomination. And what you would do in that case is you say, well, look at Here I need my cornbread to be divisible by five. In other words, I needed to, have, to be sliced into it five parts of equal size. Here I need eighths. Well, you see, if you try to do this just with the number line alone, you say, okay, this already comes in five pieces, so I'll divide each of the five pieces into eight pieces. This already comes in eight pieces, so I'll divide each of the eight pieces into five pieces. And can you see how cluttered this is going to become? Students have a hard time visualizing this. Look what happens when we use the cornbread model. We're still trying to compare two-fifths versus three-eighths. So what do we do here? We say, OK, if, if we want the number of pieces to be divisible by five and also to be divisible by eight, let's take the cornbread and we'll divide it into eight pieces of equal size, let's say the vertical, the vertical slices, okay? And then we'll horizontally divide the cornbread into five pieces of equal size. So what is two-fifths of 40 pieces? Two-fifths of 40 pieces, well, here's your two-fifths. See, one-fifth, two-fifths. Each of these is what, eight pieces? See, we want two-fifths of 40 pieces. So this is eight pieces, and this is eight pieces. That would be 16 pieces. Okay? And what would 3 eighths of 40 pieces be? 
Well, the eighths are going this way, so we want three eighths. Each eighth is five pieces. See, 40 divided by eight is five, and we're taking three of those pieces. Now, we couldn't compare the two and the three here because they were modifying different nouns. But we can compare the 16 and the 15 here because all the pieces are the same size. So in other words, two-fifths of 40 pieces is one piece more than three-eighths of 40 pieces. By the way, we're not going to do this quite yet, but I did want you to see what this really says in terms of the arithmetic of fractions. It says if you take two-fifths, it's what? It's one piece more than three-eighths. So how much bigger is it? A piece is what? One of what it takes 40 of to make the whole cornbread. And this, to me, is relatively easy for students to see. This, to me, seems to be the stumbling block that most students have. In fact, they look at the numerators and they think, what? I'm taking away more than what I have here. But that's like saying two dimes minus three pennies is seven cents. You're still taking away three pennies from two dimes. So at any rate, I thought that this would be a nice segue to get into. But how do we look at this from a different point of view? In other words, how do we know, for example, that I learned mechanically, if you want to get from one fraction to an equivalent fraction, you just multiply numerator and denominator by the same whole number. So if somebody wanted me to convert two-fifths into fifteenths, I would say five goes into fifteen three times, three times two is six. And what I really did was, when I said five goes into fifteen three times, I was multiplying the denominator by three, and then when I said three times two is six, I was multiplying the numerator by three. And what that was saying, in reality, was if you multiply numerator and denominator of a fraction by the same number, you get a different fraction, but it names the same number. So for example, his two fifths, how could I see how many fifteenths this would be? Well, for example, couldn't I divide each of these pieces into thirds? And now the five pieces have become 15 smaller pieces, right? And these six pieces, each piece, each bigger piece, has become three smaller pieces, and that's why I multiplied numerator and denominator by three. What I would like to show you is that if you use the cornbread model, all you have to do is say, okay, here's my two-fifths. All I'm gonna do now is horizontally Divide this into three equally sized pieces. I think this will just about do it. And now what do I have? I still have these three pieces, these, these two pieces here, these two big pieces, but they're also what? Six of the smaller pieces. In other words, two of the big five piece thing are equal to six of the smaller ones. And you can see this right away from the diagram. So again, if you wanted to not draw the cornbread and compare this, see what we just did over here? We multiplied the two and the five by three and said six fifteenths, and it, six fifteenths doesn't look like two fifths, but they name the same rate, and we'll show that in terms of a physical example momentarily. Now, what did we do before? To compare the two fifths and the three eighths, we divided the cornbread into 40 equally sized pieces, uh, and then we showed that two-fifths was 16 of those pieces and that uh, three-eighths was 15 of those pieces. Well, that was pretty easy to see, but watch how this thing looks formally. You said, okay, to compare these, we need a common denominator. Since the denominators are five and eight, a common denominator will be 40. Notice the mechanical way in which I was taught. Five goes into 40 eight times. Eight times two is 16. Eight goes into 40 five times, five times three is 15. And notice that 16 fortieths, see what was one fortieth in our diagram? Wasn't that one piece of the cornbread? See, in terms of the cornbread, this is 16 pieces. 
Okay? Now, if this is too abstract, we go into what I call the unit pricing model, where we say, okay, suppose in one store they're selling two pens for $5. In another store, they're selling the same pen at a rate of three pens for $8. And you want to find out which is the better rate, meaning the cheaper rate. Okay? And you say, well, I can't compare these because the two is modifying five while the three is modifying eight. So you say, well, the common denominator would be 40, and to get from $5 to $40, you'd have to multiply by 8. So you might write something like 2 pens times 8 equals $5 times 8. And if you want to see this verbally without the magical formula of just saying multiply both by 8, you're saying, look, if I, buy, if I get two pens every time I spend $5, if I spend $5 eight times, I'm going to get two pens eight times. That gives you a way to visualize why the fraction didn't change if you multiplied numerator and denominator by the same whole number. Now you do the same thing with this number over here. You say, OK, for $40, 8 goes into 45 times, so what I'll do over here is I'll multiply numerator and denominator by 5. Now, what do I wind up here? This is 16 pens for $40. This guy is 15 pens for $40. And what this says without any reference to, notice this looks like a fraction, but I'm just using this to abbreviate or to rewrite two pens per $5. And what this says is, hey, to compare these two, for every $40 you spend, you're going to get 16 pens if you buy at this rate, but only 15 pens if you buy at this rate. In other words, for every $40 you spend, you get one more dollar, one, yeah, you get one more pen if you buy them at this rate than if you did at this rate. And that's what this means, sort of. Do you sort of get the idea? You can start from the cornbread. From the cornbread, you can get to the rote memory type of recipe, but now it won't be rote memory because they'll be able to associate that with what happened to the cornbread. And then to cement it down, you give a real physical problem to show how this works in the real world. So in summary, what we did was we showed that two common fractions are said to be equivalent if they represent the same number. Given a common fraction, we obtain an equivalent common fraction by multiplying or dividing the numerator and denominator by the same non-zero number. Notice, by the way, I did things in terms of multiplying. Remember what I said? I said, like, to get from two-fifths to fortieths, you multiply both by eight. Well, you know, we tend to read formulas and equations from left to right. Read it from right to left. What this said was, 16 fortieths is equivalent to 2 fifths. And how did we get 2 fifths from 16 fortieths? We didn't multiply both by 8. We divided both by 8. But be careful. Keep away. Don't allow the students to say, if I do the same thing to top and bottom, I will always get an equivalent fraction. Be very careful about that. For example, if I start with 2 fifths and I multiply numerator and denominator by 3, I get 6 fifteenths. And these are equivalent, aren't they? If I can buy two pens for $5, if I spend $5 three times, that's $15, I will get two pens three times, that's six pens. But look what happens if I add three to both the numerator and denominator. The two fifths becomes two plus three over five plus three, that's five eighths. And five out of eight is not the same rate as two out of five. And in fact, to see why these are different, did you notice, remember we talked about the same difference before? When I added the three to both the numerator and denominator, didn't the number of pieces between the numerator and the denominator stay the same? In other words, here the, the difference is three, here the difference is also three. 
What this says is if I divide the cornbread into five pieces of equal size and take two of them, okay, there will still be three pieces left. If I divide it into eight pieces and take five of them, there will also be three pieces left. But the three pieces that are left when I divide the cornbread into eight pieces are smaller than when I divide it into five pieces. So in other words, when you add the same number to numerator and denominator, you, if the fraction was less than one, you actually get a bigger answer than what you started with by adding on the same to the numerator and the denominator. And again, for a concluding remark here, notice again psychologically why I like to start with pieces of the cornbread, then wean the students away from that into fractions because look at how much more colloquial it sounds to talk about pieces of the cornbread as opposed to saying halves, thirds, fourths, and fifths. In other words, I can say the, the piece you get if you slice it into two pieces of equal size, three pieces of equal size, four pieces of equal size, etc. But at any rate, let's conclude for today with our usual practice problem where I will ask you to uh, pause the video, read the question, give me the answer, and uh, come back and see how I did the problem. And the practice problem today is find a common fraction whose numerator is 30 that is equivalent to the common fraction 2 fifths. Well, what did I say the problem was? I want to get an equivalent fraction where the numerator is 30. What did I do to the numerator to get to 30? in terms of multiplication. See, don't say I added 28, so I'll add 28 here. We saw that you don't get equivalent fractions that way. It's with respect to multiplication. I, ha I would have to take this 15 times, but if I multiply the numerator by 15, I also have to multiply the denominator by 15. So this says 2 fifths is equivalent to 30 70 fifths. And in terms of the pens problem, if I can buy two pens for $5, at that rate, I'll be able to get 30 pens for $75. And be careful that the answer depends on whether it's the 30 is in the numerator or in the denominator. For example, if the denominator is 30, that says to get from 5 to 30, I had to multiply by 6. So I got to multiply this man by 6. See, this one says to me, if I'm, if I'm buying two pens for $5, how many pens do I get for $75? And the answer is 30 pens. This one says, if I get two pens for $5, how many pens did I get if I spent $30? And the answer is 12 pens. So you start to see, again, how much the language of common fractions is just a different way, uh, in fact, a way of almost abbreviating the commands we would have to give if we insisted that everything be whole numbers, but that ultimately we, convert, we can convert all fraction problems into equivalent whole number problems. And so if the youngster really learns to understand whole number arithmetic and also learns to understand the adjective noun thing, they will never have to learn anything new to do fractions. And I think that brings us to the end of today's lesson. Uh, I will see you all again next time. Meanwhile, stay well, have fun, work hard.